Good Friday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. Savannah is off today. Right now on Morning News Now, travel frenzy. Millions of Americans are heading out of town this July 4th weekend. But those getaway plans have a bigger price tag this time around. Whether you're taking to the skies or hitting the road, how you can make the most out of every dollar. Plus the latest on a pilot strike that may impact the more than 11 million Americans who are flying this weekend. In recess, the Supreme Court ends a term like no other from the historic overturning of Roe versus Wade to rulings impacting gun rights and most recently climate change, what these decisions mean moving forward. And with Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson officially sworn into the nation's highest court, what to expect from the newest justice when the court reconvenes this fall. Tracking concerns with abortion bans now in place in several states, is your period tracker app or your search history safe? The information legal experts say could be used against someone seeking an abortion. Plus, a new perspective. A 14-year-old harnesses his skills as a photographer to display his toy car through his unique lens. The story behind these remarkable photos later this hour. Good to have you with us on the beginning of this holiday weekend. And we begin with the kickoff to what will be one of the biggest 4th of July getaways in years. Travel forecasters say we are going to get close to reaching pre-pandemic levels. Millions of Americans are hitting the roads and taking to the skies. That's despite high gas prices and worries over flight cancellations. And it's not just travel. Those 4th of July cookouts will also cost you more. The average price of hot dogs is up 43% this year. Beverages are up too. Soda is more expensive and beer prices are nearly 8% higher. We're going to have full coverage this morning and we're going to begin with NBC News correspondent Maggie Vespa who is in Chicago. Maggie, good morning to you. As we mentioned, AAA is forecasting one of the busiest travel seasons we've seen in a long time. Let us know right. just how bad is it going to be on the roads? I mean, Joe, it's going to be crowded and it's going to be expensive. I mean, take a look uh, at these travel totals. 47.9 million Americans expected to travel over the 4th of July holiday. 42 million of them expected to be driving. The rest, of course, flying and taking the train. And a lot of headaches expected, but especially the price of gas. Top of mind for a lot of people. When you look at current totals, I mean, you know, they're still painful. We're hovering at 484 for the national average for a gallon of gas um, nationwide. That is coming down from the peak of where it was above five dollars just a week or two ago but it is still wild when you look at past totals i mean we've come up more than a dollar fifty in the last year and then of course when you pivot back to people flying delays and cancellations have been stacking up for weeks we've all been watching that story progress and already this morning hundreds of them popping up across the country and of course it's still early joe my travel plans this weekend involve an Amtrak train and a ferry. So I'm a bit of an outlier. Most folks are driving or flying. Okay. What's the advice for those <laughs> folks to get ahead of any potential travel headaches besides, hey, you should have left yesterday. Well, now it's too late. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I'll check specifically for your travel advice because that's <laughs> definitely an outlier. But uh, for people flying and driving, uh, the mutual advice is definitely to allow for extra time. And I know that doesn't sound like much fun or maybe not even realistic for some people, but experts say it is pivotal um, given this travel weekend and all the headaches we're seeing. If you're driving, they say try and leave before noon today. That's ideal. If you're flying, sign up for those airlines alerts so that if your flight is canceled, you can find out early and uh, make a backup plan. Joe. And with many Americans really feeling the pinch when it comes to their wallets. You're in Illinois. They've eliminated a 1% grocery tax there for a year to try and help offset the cost increase. What's the reaction there? I mean, it's not much, but do folks say, hey, every cent counts? 100%. I mean, that's going into effect today. So a lot of people kind of finding out about it as we speak. It's why we're at this Jewel Osco this morning. We want to ask shoppers about it as it officially kicks in. But we've been talking to people leading up to this. As you said, it's 1%, so there is, I guess, kind of a sarcastic, like, whoop-de-doo element to that. But at the same time, they're not going to turn any savings down. Take a listen. I mean, I'll take it since it's, like, 1%. It's cheaper than what it was, but it definitely could be better. But. Yeah, has it been, I mean, how hard has it been for, for families that you've it's, seen? It's been, like, really hard. Like, um, we live in Iowa, but, like, Illinois is pretty close to us, so, like, we could just hop over and buy groceries. But, um... Yeah, it's just been a lot of struggle. Like, we spend so much money, like, left and right, and sometimes we, like, don't get groceries for, like, two months. 
And then we should note, too, to dry and bring some more relief. The governor of Illinois also suspending the inflation adjustment for Illinois' motor fuel tax rate, a.k.a. a gas tax. And that sounds great, too. But when you look at it, it actually boils down to a reduction of 2.2 cents per gallon. So talking to people there, again, they're saying they'll take what they can get. But obviously, families are still hurting. Joe. That's definitely the case. Maggie Vespa, bonus points for incorporating whoop de doo into your report this morning. We appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so let's, much. <laughs> let's dig in a little bit more now and talk about just how expensive this 4th of July is going to be for everyone. Take that backyard barbecue. The average price tag for a cookout for 10 is nearly $70. That's up 10 bucks from just last year. Kristen Myers is editor in chief of The Balance and joins us now. So, Kristen, if that barbecue is 10 bucks more, what exactly are we spending more on and how can we rein in costs if we're having a big 4th of July celebration. Good morning, Joe. Yeah, there's a lot of items at the grocery store that is going to be far more expensive this year than last year. And over at The Balance, we actually decided to do an analysis of some of those really, you know, popular or favorite barbecue items that folks could really be spending a lot of money on this year. And we found chicken wings, of, of all the things, actually was seeing the biggest increases, up 54% since last year. And then after that, it's actually the propane tank, up 26%. So just even turning your grill on joe is actually going to be setting you back a pretty penny that really hits the point every aspect is up this year i mean we mentioned also the high price of gas and we heard that that's not going to stop people from driving in fact a report by the travel website the vacationer says 55 percent of americans still plan to travel for the holiday that is an eight percent increase over last year what are you hearing is the reason for this that people are still hitting the roads you know what? It's really just all about that pent up demand. You know, everyone was stuck inside for so long. So even though we are seeing a lot of American consumers changing some of their spending habits, uh, deciding to to spend a little bit differently, even drive less, they are still not going to turn down an opportunity to travel, get out of their house, see their friends and see their families. You know, we were wondering, hey, maybe people might not decide to barbecue this year. And I don't think that that's going to change this year just because prices are going to be a little bit higher. I think what's going to happen is that people are going to start making a little bit of changes to their plans. Maybe they won't drive as far. Uh, maybe they decide instead of those chicken wings, for example, they're going to load up on hamburgers instead. But I think, again, Americans are making it very clear when it comes to spending. They're going to continue to spend money, even though these inflation levels are still hovering near those 40 year highs. Let's talk more about those gas prices. We were just seeing images of a moment ago. The national National gas price averages have been declining ever so slightly. On Thursday, the average was $4.85 per gallon. That's according to AAA. So why are we seeing this gradual drop? Can we expect that trend to continue? Yeah, I never thought I would be in a scenario where I would say, oh, thank God, gas is only $4.84. Uh, but that's where we are right now, because since it was at those record highs of over $5 um, a gallon nationally on average. Uh, the reason for this right now is actually some recession fears, um, and demand is starting to drop. Uh, so that risks of, a, of recession are really weighing on demand. So we are seeing oil prices starting to decline. Now, of course, oil prices essentially precede what we're going to be seeing at the pump. So when oil comes down, we do see those gas prices come down. Uh, OPEC Plus, that's the oil cartel, they also have decided they're going to stick with their production strategy. So they're actually going to start increasing oil production, at least for the next couple of months. We're going to have to wait till the end of the summer into the fall to see what they decide to do going forward. So there does look like there could be some relief, some. I, I want to caveat this and say, we are still seeing, however, incredibly high gas prices. So, but again, as, as your previous reporter was saying, every every cent counts. So I think people are happy to see those prices decline even just 10 or even 20 cents a gallon. We will take what we can get. Kristen Myers, thank you so much for joining us. Have a great holiday weekend. Thanks. Whether you're making plans to travel or to ooh and awe ah at the fireworks, weather is going to play a key role this weekend. <laughs> so let's get a check on your morning news now forecast with Michelle Grossman. Hey there, Michelle.
Hey there, Joe. I love that. Yeah, well, we're looking at some showers to start out today and also really the first part of the weekend. And then we have an improvement for the actual holiday. So taking a look at radar, we're looking at some showers early this morning. We're looking at uh, the radar really lit up in the plains, the Midwest, the Rockies. We're looking at the Great Lakes into the South Central States, also some showers and storms. And that will be the story as we go throughout the rest of today. As we zoom in a little closer to the Southeast, the South Central States, this is really the area we've been watching for the past few days. We're we're going to continue to watch it uh, today and also over the next several days. We have that stationary boundary that's been draped there, bringing those showers and storms. You can see some heavy rain in parts of Louisiana and also Texas. That's going to be the bullseye of where we're going to see the most rain. So really soaking rain through Saturday. Lake Charles, you're in in the bullseye. Totals up to seven inches of rain. We do have a flash flood uh, watch through Houston, also Galveston through Saturday. Also looking at heavy rain along the coast of Carolinas into parts of Florida and you can see also some other areas where we have pockets of heavier rain. Now, as we move to the northeast, we have a cold front that's moving through. It's going to cross through the Great Lakes, bringing showers through Ohio to Maine today. And then by tomorrow, this is where it gets a little tricky, especially if you'll be traveling on the roadways, also the air. We're going to see the chance for severe storms with downpours through the east from New York City to Boston, Philadelphia, D.C. You're included there. So certainly some slowdowns slow downs as you head on the roads and also in the air. 48 million at risk for damaging winds up to 60 miles per hour. Could see some damaging hail as well. We do have a tornado threat as well. So again, that's a pretty large area where we're looking at strong storms. So tomorrow we're looking at uh, impacts through Boston to D.C. And then we improve Monday. We kind of clear that out. We still do have some slowdowns likely through Charlotte, Atlanta, Orlando, and also Miami. Now we're hot. Today is going to be a hot and humid day in the Northeast. Temperatures into the 90s in D.C. It's going to feel like 97 once you back in that humidity. But Joe, by tomorrow, that cold front moves through and then we're feeling pretty good after that. Back right. to you. I can feel the humidity coming off the screen there. All right, Michelle, thank you so much. We'll check See in me. with you next hour. <laughs> The Supreme Court has wrapped up a truly historic term. The finale, Justice Stephen Breyer swearing in his successor, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson, yesterday before he retired from the high court. This year, the court's conservative majority ended the federal right to abortion, expanded rights to carry guns in public, and defended the role of religion in public settings. Just a few of the huge decisions from one of the court's most consequential terms. NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalos joins us now to take a closer look at all this. Danny, good morning to you. I do want to start with one of the last two rulings that came down yesterday, it's getting a lot of attention. The decision limits the EPA's ability to regulate the energy sector. Chief Justice John Roberts wrote in the majority opinion that trying to force a transition away from coal by capping carbon emissions was, quote, a sensible solution to the crisis of the day, but it is not plausible that Congress gave the EPA the authority to adopt on its own such a regulatory scheme. So, Danny, Walk us through this decision and what exactly does this mean now for President Biden's climate agenda? This decision is less about whether or not there is a climate change crisis and more about whether or not Congress empowered the EPA uh, to extend its power beyond that which Congress gave it. And this is a common theme of the conservative originalist uh, block of the court, which is that a, an agency, a regulatory agency, cannot exceed the powers given to it by Congress, even if that is ostensibly for a very good moral reason. It simply isn't allowed. And uh, essentially, if Congress wanted to give that regulatory agency the power to do so, it had to say so explicitly. And that is a, like I said, whether you're talking about immigration or uh, energy regulation, that is a common theme with this court. They are very careful, the conservative majority, to not expand the regulatory agency power beyond that which Congress gives it. There was a victory for the Biden administration yesterday. The court upheld the president's decision to end the Trump era remain in Mexico policy. That one forced asylum seekers at the southern border to stay in Mexico until their claims were decided. What more can you tell us about that ruling? Just like the prior ruling we were talking about, the EPA case, uh, you have a case here that is really about the same kind of thing, the extent to which Congress gives a regulatory agency power uh, or the administration, the Biden administration, power to do things that Congress may not have been explicit about. But in this case, Chief Justice Roberts pointed out that the language in the statute says that the administration may, may return uh, asylum seekers to Canada or Mexico pending the uh, asylum process. And Justice Roberts concluded that because it said may return, that also includes the choice to may not return. 
and keep those asylum seekers here in the U.S. or just choose not to return them to their home countries or Canada or Mexico. So because Justice Roberts found that power within the animating statute, then the Biden administration had the power here. And it was not uh, undone by other seemingly conflicting areas of the statute that may have taken that power away. The magic words were may return. And if you may return them, then you may not return them to their home country. So, Danny, big picture here. We know every Supreme Court term is important, but this one, it really felt like one major sort of game changing ruling after another. What did this term tell us about the overall philosophy of this court and really its willingness to take on old precedents? Uh, it, certainly, this is a court that takes a view of stare decisis and precedent uh, in a way that they are willing to look at it, and particularly in cases of constitutional import. Uh, the ability to overturn prior precedent is stronger, according to this court, when the precedent involves strictly constitutional issues. And we saw that uh, in this term with the momentous Dobbs case. But the big takeaway is that this is a court that appears to be ruling right down party and ideological lines. Uh, we see a lot of 6-3 rulings and occasional 9 nothing, but mostly going right down the line. Danny, looking ahead, the court has also announced some of the cases it's going to hear in the next term. Quickly, could it be another seismic session? It could be. I don't think anything will be as seismic as this last month in the Supreme Court. It's been breathtaking. And the, uh, the spectrum of issues addressed by the court have, have been just so dramatic. Uh, you know, everything from abortion to EPA to gun rights to uh, to even cases that would normally, I think, be a big deal that flew under the radar, uh, whether or not doctors can be prosecuted uh, for negligently prescribing opiates. And opiates, of course, affect everybody in this country in some way, tangentially. So uh, I don't know that we'll ever have enough, another uh, Supreme Court term as momentous as this one. Danny Savalo is finding the perfect hotel backdrop this morning. Danny, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Have a good holiday weekend. Staying with the Supreme Court, President Biden has condemned the decision to overturn Roe versus Wade, calling the ruling, quote, outrageous behavior and a mistake. The president also called on Congress to address the long discussed filibuster in order to restore privacy rights to people who are seeking abortions. He had this to say during the conclusion of the NATO summit in Madrid. I believe we have to codify Roe v. Wade in the law, and the way to do that is to make sure the Congress votes to do that. And if the filibuster gets in the way, it's like voting rights, it should be we provide an exception for this. For more on this, let's bring in NBC News correspondent Maura Barrett, who is covering the White House, and NBC News Capitol Hill correspondent Ali Rafa. Good to have both of you with us. Maura, let's start with you. This is a major departure from the president's previous comments on the filibuster. He had previously said changing the rules in Congress sets a dangerous precedent. So what changed? Is the president under pressure to try and get this done, perhaps ahead of the midterms? Absolutely, Joe. And you heard uh, in the press conference yesterday, closing out NATO, Joe Biden very specific to refer to abortion rights around privacy rights, trying to call uh, everyone under his umbrella there, essentially. And when it comes to the filibuster, we did see uh, him be more open to it when it came to voting access before. And so it has changed. He has changed his position on this. But we did. We have seen a lot of pressure from voters since the Roe v. Wade decision was overturned. I spent a lot of time outside of the Supreme Court uh, in the days after. After that, and people were really adamant that while they are ready to vote come November to put more Democrats in Congress, uh, that they also want to see action now because one of the resounding chants that we heard outside of the Supreme Court was the idea of what comes next. And President Biden bringing that up in the sense of the fact that the Supreme Court could be uh, reviewing uh, rights to same sex marriage or access to contraception. And so they're looking, voters are looking to see action taken before anything like that uh, could happen going forward. So, Allie, the president's desires could be a moot point because there are two Democrats who've been staunchly against overturning the filibuster. That's Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema. Do we know if their position on this has changed at all since the president made these remarks? And remind us, what does the Democrats need to do here to get rid of the filibuster? 
Yeah, good morning, Joe. Well, we didn't hear from these two publicly yesterday, but their offices did tell us that their opinions on this have not changed despite Biden's comments. That uh, And the reality check here is that really the votes just don't exist to not only codify Roe into law, but to vote on this uh, themselves. We saw this vote fail back in May. And the gut check here is that because this vote failed back in May, because of Joe Manchin voting with Republicans, the only thing that can be done to really change that vote, the optics of that vote, is to really bring this to the ballot box. And that's what we heard from so many Democratic uh, leaders so far, is that this is going to become such a big midterm issue. And really, the reason that Senators Manchin and Cinema are saying that they're not changing their minds on this is that uh, they're saying that this vote, if they do vote to change the filibuster rules, it could really backfire on them if and when Republicans uh, earn back the Senate majority in the midterm elections, Joe. So, Maura, President Biden is set to meet virtually with seven governors later today to discuss the future of abortion. What's the goal of this meeting? Well, Joe, as the White House puts it, these are states that acted swiftly to protect, to protect abortion rights right after the Roe v. Wade decision was overturned. We're going to see states like Connecticut, Illinois, California, Oregon. And when you look at the map there, you'll see that some of these states are surrounded by those states that immediately uh, had those trigger laws going into, in, into effect or states that are considering abortion bans. And so the White House is trying uh, to support these states that have taken action to pro protect the right to an abortion uh, in any way they can, because as we can expect those public health institutions are going to be inundated with patients working to cross state lines. The White House also saying it's working to protect that right as well. It actually updated uh, its patient privacy guidelines yesterday to make sure that certain patient data disclosures uh, aren't able to be transferred over state lines. People aren't, uh, healthcare institutions wouldn't be held accountable state by state uh, to reveal, for example, if someone had had an abortion across state lines uh, if they needed to travel from a state where it was illegal. And so the White House has been very adamant that because it is now a state-by-state -state approach that they want to support the states uh, as they work towards protecting that right to an abortion. Ali, let's shift gears slightly here. President Biden has been laying the groundwork for a run for re-election in 2024, two years from now. His approval ratings, they're much lower than when he took office, but he is the incumbent. He's the leader of the party. Does it feel like he has the full support of his party and party leaders right now? Well, that's an interesting question, because remember, for a while, it was a mystery whether he would run again. We heard, you know, optimism from White House officials, but no official 2024 uh, running plan. And so it almost left an opening for Democrats to wonder what the options were. And now that we're hearing official plans for a 2024 run, Democrats in Congress really have a decision to make. And some are taking the stance of, you know, Biden is more following than leading. And some say that they don't think that's enough to be able to win a 2024 election against a possible Trump 2024 bid. Uh, some are saying that he ran as a moderate who could bring people together in 2020, and he shifted it further to the left. Others others maintain it's just a, a time for a new generation of Democrats to lead. Uh, and with Biden nearing, he, he will be nearing 82 years old in November of 2024. So they think it's just time for a new person at, at the, the leadership of this country. Uh, so really, he's looking for leadership and loyalty on this issue. We heard uh, Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez a couple weeks ago be very hesitant, really dodging questions of whether she'd support him. And then you have Senator Bernie Sanders, a former opponent, uh, committing to not running in 2024 if Biden is on the ticket. So really, I think it's still still pretty early for Democrats to pledge their support, but already we're seeing the rifts in the Democratic Party, Joe. Very early, but 2022 may answer a lot of questions about 2024. Maura Barrett and Ali Rafa, thank you both for joining us. Appreciate it. Coming up on Morning News Now, we are following breaking news overnight out of Ukraine, where at least 18 people are dead after a Russian missile strike in the city of Odessa. We're going to have the latest on the ground and the Ukrainians' fight to keep control of that region. Next. Breaking news out of Ukraine this morning. Officials say at least 19 people have died and dozens were left injured after Russian missiles hit a residential area in the southern region of Odessa. The attack took place in the early hours of Friday. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber joins us now from Kyiv with the latest on this. So, Ellison, what more can you tell us about these strikes and, and have the Russians said anything about it? Hey, Joe. So right now we understand that rescue operations are still underway and local officials say they fear there are still people trapped 
underneath the rubble. Russia routinely says, and they're saying this again now, that they do not attack or target civilians or civilian infrastructure. But there is evidence routinely that that is not true and that that does happen quite a bit. This appears to be another example of it. Ukrainian officials say Russian missiles hit a residential apartment building and two recreation camps. They say right now at least 19 people are dead, dozens injured, including children and a pregnant woman. They are reportedly hospitalized. In that apartment building alone, officials say 152 people lived there. And right now, most of the injuries they've seen have come from the strike on the apartment building. And again, they say a number of people from that building, as well as the other recreation camps, are unaccounted for. Joe? We know you'll keep us updated on that throughout the day. Ellison, mm -hmm. I also want to ask you, I know you've been speaking with LGBTQ soldiers mm -hmm. who are fighting in the Ukrainian army. What's their experience been mm -hmm. like? Yeah, you know, for LGBTQ plus Ukrainians, particularly young Ukrainians, they tell us that they feel like this fight is a fight that is life or death for them every single day. We have spoken to a number of people serving openly in the military and also LGBTQ plus activists in Kyiv. And there are actually a lot of military members who are serving openly, not just amongst their peers, but literally wearing a patch to identify themselves as LGBTQ plus. They call themselves the Unicorn Battalion. It's an unofficial group, but they say they know by physically marking themselves with these patches and identifying as who they are, that if they were captured by Russian forces, it could very well mean that they are tortured, they are killed, that they would be treated, they say, very different than their straight counterparts. But they refuse to hide. We spoke to a combat medic who has served on the front lines. Listen to what he told us about this fight. For the LGBTQI community, it's a question of uh, surviving here, to fighting for Ukraine and on this side, because we haven't another choice. We, we can die on the battlefield uh, until we fighting for freedom, or we can die in Russian uh, concentration camps or something like that. So I prefer to fight and can have a change for a uh, good life after. There's still a long way to go towards equality in Ukraine. There's a long way to go in the United States as well. But when we speak to activists, they tell us that they have made a lot of progress in this country over the years, and they're afraid all of that could be wiped away. And when you look at rights they have here in Ukraine versus Russia, where there's a so-called gay propaganda law, where you can be arrested simply for advocating for LGBTQ rights. And then you look back at what happened in Chechnya, where President Vladimir Putin turned a blind eye to gay men forcibly being rounded up, taken to concentration camp-like facilities, and being tortured and beaten, they say nothing compares. They are in this fight to move towards Europe because they want to live in a more equal society. And so for them, they are willing to sacrifice anything for it, but they also refuse to shy away from who they are. And so they are very proudly telling their colleagues in the Ukrainian military and also Russian forces who they are and how they live. Joe. Incredible bravery, ages that they're fighting in the first place, but to wear mm -hmm. those unicorn patches, that is yeah. absolutely incredible, Ellison. Thanks for bringing mm -hmm. us that. Well, I have you. I want to ask you, yesterday, Russia said it was going to pull out of the strategic snake island in the back sea, calling it a goodwill yeah. gesture. But the Ukrainians see it differently, right? What, what are they saying? Mm-hmm. Right. So they say that they forced them out because Ukrainian forces have been repeatedly bombarding this F, uh, this island that Russian forces have occupied since February. Today, the Institute for the Study of War, they say that ultimately what they believe happened here is that in recent weeks, as Ukrainian forces ramped up their attacks here, they were also attacking ships and various things that Russia was using to try to get additional supplies to the island. And because of all of that, they just forced Russia to leave. They say this is a strategic victory for Ukraine, not a gesture of goodwill, as Russia claims. It's not going to necessarily end the blockade as it relates to grain, but this is a significant win for Ukraine. Joe? Ellison Barber in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Let's get more on Ukraine with retired Lieutenant General Steph Twitter.
Twitty. He is the former deputy commander of the United States European Command. Good to have you with us. I want to ask you about these recent attacks we've seen on civilian areas like this morning, as Ellison was just talking about in Odessa and that mall strike we saw earlier this week. Ukraine's brigadier general says Russia is trying to hit military and critical infrastructure, but it's using old Soviet era missiles in more than 50 percent of the strikes, which he says are less accurate. British intelligence said a similar thing about the mall attack, that it's possible Russia intended to hit nearby infrastructure but struck the shopping center instead. Do you agree with that assessment? And what does it tell us about Russia's strategy? Yeah, good morning, Joe. Well, that assessment could be true, but the facts, we don't know. And so what I will tell you is if you go back to the beginning of this war and on through the days here, we know that Russia has continued to hit civilian targets. So in my mind, you know, throughout this entire war, they've done this anyway. Reckless, indiscriminate uh, attacks against the civilian populace to terrorize them. So I don't know whether or not they may be running low on precision guided missiles. We just don't know that yet. Or whether or not these are dumb bums that, uh, Russia has uh, fired and just missed their target out. But what I do know, it doesn't matter because this is going on throughout the war with these reckless attacks against civilians. I want to ask you about yesterday's NATO meeting where President Biden announced an extra $800 million in military aid to Kiev while pledging continued support to Ukraine. Let's, let's hear more of what he said. We are going to stick with Ukraine and all of the alliance are going to stick with Ukraine as long as it takes. And so I don't know what, how it's going to end, but it will not end with a Russian defeat of Ukraine in Ukraine. So you heard it there, the president saying they're going to stick it out as long as it takes. I mean, realistically, do you think the U.S. can keep up this support long term, especially with an election year here and, and midterms on the horizon? Well, I think so. And we also have to understand this is just not a U.S. effort. This is a NATO effort here where we have 30 countries that make up NATO. And as you watch this summit this week, all of them virtually pledge some type of support to NATO, whether it be the U.S. Pled pledging 800 more in aid. As you know, we also pledge more troops to move to the east and also in the west and rotor. We're going to put two more destroyers. We're going to put some F-35s up in Europe to increase our capability there. But Canada pledged armored personnel carriers and more troops. The UK pledged another one billion and more troops. And I can go on and on. And so it's just not going to be a US effort here. It's going to be a NATO effort. And oh, by the way, we're going to soon have two more new NATO members in Sweden and uh, Finland. Another major development in the last few days. Lieutenant General Steph Twitty, thanks so much for joining this morning. Have a great holiday weekend. Thank you. More international headlines now. The trial for WNBA star Brittany Griner began today in Russia. NBC's Raf Sanchez joins us now from Tel Aviv with that and more world headlines. Raf, good morning. Joe, good morning. That's right. Brittany Griner's trial starting in a Moscow courtroom, but journalists were barred from covering the hearing. You remember Griner was arrested back in February at a Moscow airport and charged with carrying cannabis oil. The State Department says she's been wrongfully detained and that it's working to bring her home. In India, at least 16 people are dead. Another 70 are missing after a major mudslide. Weeks of heavy rain sent a wall of mud slamming into a railway construction site. Rescuers are using earth movers to try to find trapped people, but it's difficult going in the mud and uneven terrain. And finally, an Australian state is bursting the bubble of balloon enthusiasts. Starting next year in Queensland, it will be illegal to release big bunches of balloons into the air at celebrations. The ban is, of course, part of an effort to cut down on single-use plastics, which are so damaging to the environment. Joe, they may have to remake that movie up with something a little greener than plastic balloons, right? Yeah, exactly. Maybe they can edit in some drones or something to lift them up. All right, Raph, thanks so much. Appreciate it. Coming up in morning news now, with states banning abortion, could period tracker apps, search histories, even text messages be used as evidence by law enforcement? We're going to put that question to a legal expert next. We're back.
back with more fallout over the end of Roe versus Wade. The battle over abortion rights is only intensifying in state houses and courthouses across the country. NBC News correspondent Ann Thompson has the latest on the rapidly changing laws and what could come next. Moves on the state level to restrict abortions hitting legal obstacles. Florida's ban on abortions after 15 weeks blocked in court. That it violates the privacy provision of the Florida Constitution. Disappointing the governor. Yeah, these are unborn babies that have heartbeat. Kentucky's trigger law, a near total ban, put on a temporary hold too, applauded by that state's governor. The trigger law in Kentucky is extremist. Now a new salvo in the abortion rights war. Conservative lawmakers looking at potential laws to keep women from crossing state lines for legal abortions by targeting corporations paying their travel expenses. Arkansas State Senator Jason Rapert leads the National Association of Christian Lawmakers. We are, are, are exploring legislation and drafting language that would stop some of these woke corporations from using shareholder money illegally and without real authority to traffic people for the cause of an abortion. Some say any effort to stop women from crossing state lines is a step too far. This would be like Virginia passing a law saying that it's illegal for me to go to Maryland to get dental care or illegal for me to have my primary care physician be in the District of Columbia. 90 local prosecutors from across the country have signed on to a statement refusing to prosecute those who seek, provide, or support abortions, calling criminalizing abortion care a mockery of justice. St. Louis County District Attorney Wesley Bell. But if your state bans abortion, isn't it your job to enforce the law? Well, it's well-settled law that prosecutors have discretion over the limited criminal justice resources that we have. And we make decisions all the time. And, and that guiding principle is public safety and justice. A nation still debating what's enforceable and what's law in a post-Roe world. Ann Thompson, NBC News. The end of Roe is also raising concerns about women's privacy in the use of period tracking apps. Millions of women use apps like Flow, Clue, Ovia Fertility, and Eve by Glow to track their menstrual cycles and possible pregnancies. But it's the data that's stored in these apps now raising red flags. Cybersecurity experts say information there could be used against women who seek or consider illegal abortions. It has prompted apps like Flow to create anonymous mode, which allows users to remove their personal identity and prevents the app from linking data to an individual user. Joining us now to break all this down is former federal prosecutor and NBC News legal analyst, Cynthia Oxney. So Cynthia, let's start from the beginning. First of all, help us understand exactly how these apps work and, and is there reason for concern here? There's definitely reason for concern. I mean, I would advise anybody who lives in a red state where abortion is now illegal, either not to use these apps because there is data there uh, or to get an app that's based in Europe where they're less likely to comply with a subpoena uh, should they get one from some overzealous prosecutor. I mean, it's just, you know, you just, everything is in the web and you have to be really careful. And the sad truth is these apps are the tip of the iceberg. I mean, you, you know, we have problems with what about your medical records? What about the data on your cell phone? What about geofencing? What about your search engine? All of this you have to think about if you live in one of these red anti-abortion states. When we talk about these period tracking apps, I mean, is it even legal for the companies behind those apps to hand over user data to law enforcement? If they get a subpoena or they get a warrant, not only is it legal, they're likely to do it. And, you know, some of them will fight individual cases, but recognize you do not have privacy when it comes to these apps. You do not have privacy if you um, turn your cell phone on and walk into an anti-abortion clinic. Uh, that, that data is tracked. You do not have privacy if you get on your Google search engine and look for uh, an abortion clinic. You do not have privacy if you say, Alexa, where's the closest place I can get an abortion? There is no privacy. And right now, um, there are a lot of the law is shaking out about how this is going to wind down. Is there going to be new federal statutes on HIPAA extensions? Are there going to be new statutes from different states on you can't turn over? Um, 
this it, all this data. But it, it has to have some time to germinate and to work through the courts and work through the legislatures. So in order to protect yourself, you need to be really smart and recognize, you know, for instance, if you need an abortion and you live in a red state and you go to California to get it, pay with cash. Don't put it on your credit card because some overzealous prosecutor in Kansas or in Texas or someplace can say the if if the child was if the if the fetus was um, created in Texas, he has an interest in going after you. So you have to be careful and you have to assume the worst right now to protect yourself. We mentioned these apps that are creating anonymous mode, but that begs the question, what happens to user information that wasn't anonymous before? Well, a lot of these apps are saying they're going to be start um, they're going to start deleting the data. But, you know, as we know, nothing's ever deleted. I mean, you just have to be I can't stress enough how careful you have to be. There are interesting things that are happening to try to protect people because of this data. For instance, in Connecticut, they have a new law that says if we get a subpoena for information from uh, an anti-abortion state, we're not going to comply with it for information that's in Connecticut. But what happens if you live in Mississippi and um, you go to Connecticut because you desperately need an abortion? And that becomes part of your electronic medical record. And when you go back to Mississippi, it ends up in your record. Now it's discoverable again. So everything that's on the web is very dangerous. As much as these companies are now trying to protect you because it's their interest to protect you, if they get a subpoena or they get a warrant, they're going to turn it over. And you shouldn't rely on some vague notion of HIPAA protecting you because it does not. Cynthia Oxney, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We do appreciate it. Airlines are already struggling to meet summer schedules, especially with traffic around pre-pandemic levels. Well, now Delta pilots are calling for changes, taking their message to the picket line, how this could impact your travel plans this weekend. Plus, stealing millions, a family of four from Canada accused of stealing $8 million in pandemic relief funds from the U.S. government. Coming up, what's being done now to try and hold them accountable. We're back with an extra stress test at airports during the busy July 4th getaway. Delta pilots are taking to the picket lines at a time when airlines are canceling hundreds of flights a day. NBC News correspondent Tom Costello has more on the struggle that's leaving many passengers stranded. Walking information picket lines at seven airports nationwide. Off-duty Delta pilots in contract talks who say they're working excessive overtime as the airline tries to fly its schedule without enough pilots. Those are fatiguing schedules, working as hard as we can. Delta, United, and American have struggled since Memorial Day. More than 3,000 total cancellations just since Sunday morning. We don't have a lot of money. We don't have a lot of time. So when you do that, it, there goes your vacation. In an email to customers, Delta CEO said this level of disruption and uncertainty is unacceptable. Meanwhile, the FAA identifying volatile weather again, leading to more delays and cancellations. Today, airlines are carrying the highest numbers of passengers since early 2020. But the vast majority of Americans, 42 million, are driving this weekend, a new record, and paying record July 4th pump prices, 486 a gallon, though down 16 cents in two weeks. President Biden says the embargo on Russian oil means Americans will continue paying a premium at the pump. As long as it takes, so Russia cannot, in fact, defeat Ukraine. Higher oil prices also lead to higher jet fuel and airline ticket prices, cutting into vacation budgets on the road and in the air. Thank you, Tom. Experts say flexibility is the key to a smooth experience. Be sure to add an extra time and have several backup plans ready to go just in case your plans get derailed by delays. Financial headlines now with Wall Street ending its worst first half of a year in decades. CNBC's Bertha Coombs joins us now with that and other money headlines. Bertha, good morning. Hey, good morning, Joe. And we look looking at the futures, it looks like Wall Street is set to kick off the second half the same way it ended the first half in the red. As Joe mentioned the S&P dropped more than 20 percent in the first six months of 2022. That's the biggest decline since the Beatles were topping the music charts back in 1970. Dow down more than 15 percent so far this year, while the Nasdaq has tumbled nearly 30 percent with all those big tech stocks really, really taking 
making it hard. In Focus today, we're going to get some reports on manufacturing and construction spending ahead of what will be a long weekend for the markets, which will be closed on Monday for Independence Day. American Airlines is proposing a nearly 17 percent pay hike for its pilots by the end of 2024 as it negotiates a new contract. That offer, first reported by CNBC, comes as pilots at United are voting on a tentative deal that would raise their wages by more than 14 percent over the next year and a half. American CEO urging the union to reach an agreement soon, saying that there will be additional incentives if it's the contract is ratified by the end of September. And Instagram is testing a change to convert all video posts into reels. The company tells TechCrunch the move is part of a plan to simplify video on the app. It also comes as Instagram's parent meta platform has been betting big on reels, which now make up more than 20 percent of the time spent on Instagram. I'm sure it's also just to combat TikTok. I don't know about you, Joe, but I, I watch one reel and suddenly I'm down the rabbit hole with <laughs> really cute puppy videos, baby <laughs> videos, all the things I like to see. That is how it's supposed to work, I think, although I still like the old school photo. <laughs> That's just me. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thank you, Bertha. Yeah, Have a good, good weekend. Too. Now to an NBC News investigation into a family that's accused of fraud. Florida officials say a Florida-based pastor stole $8 million in COVID relief funds by claiming his ministry had hundreds of employees when in reality it was just his family of four. As NBC's Stephanie Gosk explains in our series, The Fleecing of America, the money was seized, but nearly two years later, no one has been charged. When the pandemic hit, Canadian Joshua Edwards asked the U.S. government to help his family's ministry stay afloat. He said they needed $6 million to keep paying more than 450 employees, according to court records, with the operation run out of this Florida office building. The government approved the PPP loan, even adding another $2 million, making it eight in total. But here's the problem. The only employees were the Edwards family, four of them. And Canadian records show the ministry's monthly income was just $5,500. The application was a total fabrication, signed off by an 88-year-old accountant in Canada suffering from dementia, as per court documents. Warren Smith is the president of Ministry Watch, an evangelical watchdog. So how didn't it flip a switch somewhere in the government when they saw this application? Well, it should have. This would have been easy if you just did a couple of Google searches on this. The bank would have known that there was nothing there. This money was supposed to go to businesses that were keeping people employed. And here you have this ministry taking advantage of that, allegedly. Yeah. Well, this kind of fraud is just absolutely reprehensible because there was a limit to those funds. Instead of funding a ministry set up to help the poor, the family put a down payment on this $3 million house in a gated community, blocks from Disney World. Within months, federal agents started asking questions. It was September 2020 and Secret Service agents came to this home where the Edwards family was living. They wanted to know what they were doing with millions of dollars in taxpayer money. But when they got here, no one was home. The cars were gone and the house was cleared out. The Secret Service quickly asked Florida Highway Patrol to pull them over. Police were waiting on this highway on ramp for the Edwards as they headed north. When they stopped them, the father said that they were on their way to a conference in Texas, but he couldn't provide any details. And according to the authorities, in the back seat, there was a paper shredder the family bought the week before and garbage bags filled with shredded documents. Federal agents seized the $8 million and briefly took them into custody for an immigration charge that was later dismissed. The next day, they were let go. And almost 20 months later, no more criminal charges. The Edwards still own their house, so we knocked on the door. No one answered, but neighbors told NBC they still live there. We reached out to the Secret Service and they said the investigation is ongoing and they can't provide any more information. The U.S. attorney in Florida would not comment. Alex Little is a former federal prosecutor. If I go into a bank and I steal $3 million and the police show up at my door and I say, oh, I'm so sorry, so sorry about that bank, here's your $3 million back, don't I get arrested? You'd absolutely get arrested, and I think we can expect and should expect the federal government to take the same steps. Why hasn't there been an arrest? It's a great question, and it should be the sort of case that federal prosecutors are interested in and ultimately end up prosecuting. Just last year, the family released new videos asking for donations, but quickly took them down. Stephanie Gosk, NBC News, Orlando. 
Coming up, a teenager's photos of his toy car collection are going viral. Why? Well, because his pictures make the cars look realistic. We're going to tell you the message he hopes to send with this project next. Welcome back. An avalanche of hockey fans hit the streets of downtown Denver to celebrate their team's big Stanley Cup win. Yesterday's parade for the Colorado Avalanche took the team and Lord Stanley's Cup through the streets in fire trucks. The Avalanche took ownership of the Stanley Cup last Sunday after defeating the two-time reigning champs, the Tampa Bay Lightning. This is the third time Colorado has clinched hockey's top title and the team's first Stanley Cup victory since 2001. Congrats to them. We end this hour with the story of one boy's fascination with toy cars, which has turned into a talent for some mind-bending photography. NBC's Maggie Vespa has his story. Anthony Schmidt's love of cars is all about perspective. At 14, he's waiting to see the world from the driver's seat. In the meantime, focusing his love through a lens, a vintage surf scene church parking of the past, a classic fueling up. On his iPhone, this teenager captures auras of eras and tricks the eye, manipulating the miniature, transforming it into life size. His parents home. Oh my goodness. Now a warehouse for his muses. 1908 Ford Model T right there. 3,000 of them. So you know every single one. Yes. What's that one? 56 Ford Sunliner. What about the one next to it? Same, 56 Ford Sunliner. Up here? 57 Chevrolet Bel Air. That colossal capacity for detail stems from Anthony's superpower. And what do you like about having autism? Not much, like about uh, having the talent and having the, probably if I, I wouldn't probably be all over the internet if I didn't have it. <laughs> This Seattle area boy born with autism is a smash hit on social media. Facebook 142,000, TikTok about 600,000. He boasts books and calendars too, a dream for mom. All the attention from different people for his photography makes him feel so good. Much of Anthony's collection, rooms of cars, a wall of plates came from fans of his drive. All autism people out there should always chase their dreams. Same with anyone, should always just chase your dreams. Shifting perspectives on cars and life. Maggie Vespa, NBC News, Woodenville, Washington. Great story. That does it for this hour of morning news now. The news continues right now. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. Follow today's top stories and breaking news by downloading the NBC News app.